I, I like honesty, and uh, I, I had a lot of trepidation about accepting to speak because, uh, quite frankly, I, I, I didn't feel qualified. Because uh, even though I'm, I give speeches or have given speeches running for office, etc., it's not the kind of stuff that I've been asked to do, which is to talk about two historical figures that and what their relationship was like. That's how he came across to me. So, so here we go. Jose Marti and Henry George were well traveled and moved by the plight of the poor everywhere. Marti traveled to Europe and throughout Central and South America. George traveled throughout the United States it was from Philadelphia, as well as Australia and India. Lived for a time in British Columbia. I believe he worked as a miner. And he did marry, I believe, a young lady from Sydney, Australia. So he saw through his travels that in spite of all the progress and advancement in the United States and elsewhere, there were pockets of poverty in which hard-working people struggled against great difficulties to better the quality of their life. And this disturbed him greatly. While Jose Marti and Henry George were contemporaries and lived in New York City, there is no actual evidence that they ever met. They were both involved in the newspaper business, Marti writing for Patria, a journal, that means uh, fatherland. The word patria in Spanish doesn't have the harshness of fatherland. It's, 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 it has a softer, more familiar sense to it. Okay, It's not the fascistic fatherland thing. It, it's a very different sense to it. Um, he wrote for patria, a journal that he founded, and various other publications in English. Henry George for the San Francisco Times and the San Francisco Post, which he founded. And also, of course, in New York, he was also a publisher. Martí's main thrust was always Cuba's independence from Spain. But he also warned against encroachment from other powers. The greatest threat, of course, being at the time the United States, which he called the monster. Marti's heart for the poor can be seen in words that appear in Guantanamera, which is really a poem that was set to music later on many years. And the, the words are, Entre los pobres de la tierra, quiero yo mi suerte echar. Among the poor of the earth, I wish to cast my lot. While a fierce and dedicated Cuban independentist, he was not the kind of nationalist who was only about his country. In other words, Marti wished for others what he wished for himself. And to the best of his ability, he wrote, helped, and encouraged Latin American countries, many of them already independent nations, to maintain their independence and promote a better quality of life for their citizens. He was involved in movements in places like Argentina to revitalize the reasons for their independence. So he was no slouch, and he was not just a Cubanist either. Spending as long as he did living in the United States, mostly in New York City, although in Key West and parts of Florida where he accomplished a lot uh, with the tobacco factories, the workers there, the lectores de tabacaria, the tobacco cigar factories, uh, the rollers would sit there and during the day they would be read. Magazines, newspapers, this is an old tradition from Cuba. One of my ancestors was a lector de tabacaria. And he had a huge library in his home because he needed it for his work. So he actually had a great impact with these men and women and he was able to actually exhort them into the notion of a Cuban independent republic. Martí really is the founder, in idea at least, 
of Cuba as an independent republic with all the arms. Okay. He grew to admire the United States. He admired the bustling industry of the United States. He loved the freedom of expression in the United States, enjoyed that freedom and he, that he found here, and he wished the same for Cuba. So he was a First Amendment guy, probably first and foremost. Martin was the son of Spaniards, interestingly. He was born in Havana, Cuba, January 28, 1853. As a young man, he wrote and spoke about the differences he saw between the Cubans and the Spaniards, having grown up with Spaniards in his own home, and how Cubans had indeed evolved into a different people from the colonialists. Much the same way the founding fathers here, the founding mothers here in the United States, had come to the same conclusion about the distinctiveness of the people from him from the people of England. Martin paid dearly for his beliefs very early on. He was in his teens. I'm not exactly sure how old he was. He might have been 17 years old. He ended up going to prison, doing time in a quarry, because he had written an essay chiding an acquaintance for having joined the Spanish army. His sentence to labor in a quarry with shackles that partially crippled him so that he had to receive medical attention throughout the rest of his life for damage done to his upper thighs and possibly even organs in the pelvis area. So freedom of speech or seeking freedom of speech cost him dearly. He was brave. Although, as I've mentioned, <laughs> Marti and George probably never met in the flesh. So, it's kind of whimsical to wondering how they met when they never met. They shared similar ideals based on the fact that both were men who cared about people, men who observed people, and men who dreamed, who had dreams about how our common everyday life could be better. Marti, like George, did not care for taxes or tariffs. This was one of his greatest complaints about Spanish rule. The, the fact that we had excessive taxation in Cuba at the hands of the Spaniards. Familiar story? <laughs> okay. Taxation without representation is not unique to here. Okay? Not at all. Not at all. <clears throat> Martí would have naturally favored a tax, a rent, a payment, whatever word you might want to use, for the land that one occupies and uses and lives on and no other form of tax. I believe, and I believe from what I know of George, this is textbook George. Based on what he said and how he projected himself as a man who abhorred slavery in all its forms, I can't imagine that Marti would have ever agreed to the form of slavery that consists of governments taking portions of one's honestly earned wages for its own use. Both Marti and George were really modern men who understood that every human being deserved the freedom to grow and prosper, to respect and be respected. Martí was probably one of those spiritual people who didn't really come very much to organize religion. I understand George had a similar inclination. I believe he asked his father to take him out of the Episcopal Church-run school that he used to go to in Philadelphia. 
organized religion in Cuba was pretty much attached to the colonial power. The Roman Catholic Church, very much attached to the absolute monarchs. Even as they were evolving from that absolutism, it was still the same thing. And they did not look kindly at first on Cuban independence, of course. So that actually meant a lot to Martí, and he made that connection. Not unusual. This happened here, too, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the Church of England. So he could range from skeptical to scathing on the topic of organized religion. Even though strangers to one another, in the sense that we normally think of strangers, Marti and George were united by their deep interest in their fellow human beings and their understanding of liberty. Marti knew of Henry George and endorsed him enthusiastically from what I've been able to find out contributing to a proliferation of George's leaning movement in Latin America. Sadly, I don't think any of them really took any root. Sadly, Martí's idea of a Cuban independent republic, in my opinion, never really took any root at all, either. Martí's known to have referred to people who commit evil deeds as being stupid. As he's known to have repeated that. And that makes a lot of sense to me. And I don't think it's a concept that is unique to Marti. I think of Martin Luther King, who pointed out that those who oppressed their fellow Americans of dark skin were hurting themselves as well. And there's nothing intelligent about that. In my circles, sometimes I'm asked if I'm a Georgist, or a Randian, or a Misian. I'm actually none of those things. Politically, I'm a libertarian. I like to think that I listen to, admire, and promote people that are promoting liberty in whatever aspect possible. More important to me, I like to think of myself as somebody who tries to follow Christ. Not a Christian, but somebody who tries to follow Christ. Because nobody makes a good Christian. <laughs> nobody. Nobody. Or for that matter, I don't think really anybody really lives up to the ideals of any other faith. However, I do believe that having a genuine concern and desire for the well-being of our fellow human beings so that they can be independent, strong, and fruitful, not so that they can be just dependent on our largesse and good feeling, that is something that, thank God, cuts across political, religious, and philosophical boundaries and can be seen in the dedication and perseverance of Jose Martí and Henry George. Or a Henry George, I think I'll send That's the beauty of these two gentlemen. This little book here called La Edad de Oro, The Age of Gold. And I translate it that way because if I say golden, it's too much like gilded. And that's not what this is. This was a reference by Martí in a series of essays aimed at young people. Some of them were originally written by him, some poems, some essays, others were actually rewrites, edited rewrites, about famous people of the time, events, etc. About this book, I was already, a, I thought I was a grown man, I was 26 at the time. My mother actually gave me this book. And, um, and I, I cherished it. She's still with us, thank God. I, I always cherished it. It's really quite a, a good, look it up, La Edad de Oro, by Jose Martí. And this is my trusty history book of the island of Cuba. And um, I've had this also. My mother also gave me this one. And I've had her also since the year 1976. Interesting, it was the 200th anniversary of the United States. You know. So he had an interest in bringing up people. This is why he was aiming this at young people. He knew that you had to help young people to become the kind of individual they should be. So he was in, in also involved in that endeavor. So always demonstrating his interest in human beings, bringing up good human beings, empathizing with other human beings. One last thing. I know the Cuban government likes to promote the idea that Jose Martí was at least simpatico with Marxism. Specifically, 
with the ideas of the Castro government. I don't think that's the case. Any more than I think that Henry George was a Marxist. He even opposed Marxism. A few decades ago, when Cuban troops were proxy troops for the Soviet Union in several places around the world, mostly Africa, Marti would have been appalled. Living in the current situation in Cuba, I believe he wouldn't have ended up in jail or exiled, just as he would have under Batista or Machado or anybody else. He would have spoken. He believed in the First Amendment. He believed in the right of I don't think that Henry George, or excuse me, I like to think that Henry George would have been a man of a very similar inclination. Thank you. I didn't come to be ignored, so go ahead. <laughs> After a wonderfully articulate statement, I'm not sure what I can say, but I was invited to make such a point. I was invited to make comments mainly about Marti because I've written quite a bit about Marti and I've written read quite a bit about Marti. I want to tell you first, I don't read Spanish. I read Thai, German, and English, and a little bit of French, but not Spanish, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> I want to say, first of all, that Marti's writing, which is prolific, is the backdrop of, of everything he, he wrote as the backdrop of Henry George. He was in New York City for 15 years. I doubt when he came whether he ever expected to stay that long. But when he was here, he wrote for lots of Latin American newspapers, mainly Mexican and Argentinian newspapers. And all his writing is now online. It was compiled at, on a CD disc, which I downloaded, and we're fortunate that it's on at least one site that Victor Ramirez here from Puerto Rico managed to put on a Spanish language website. And we're talking about the possibility that we could uh, have many more papers and much more amplification of uh, Jose Marti's ideas uh, sponsored by the Georges movement here. Now, I want to say that those articles and books that I read about Marti, and they are voluminous, I would guess that there are dozens of books in English about Marti. And I've read a good number of them. And I put essays online on the website of the International Union that I spoke about this morning. I want to also say that <clears throat> when Nation Magazine first sponsored a tour uh, of Cuba, that uh, was about uh, five years ago, I believe, I was one of about 24 people who were on that tour, mainly journalists, academics, and political activists, not-for-profit organization people. And I want to say that when Jose Marti wrote, he was writing with a Georgist paradigm in his mind but he wrote mainly about the United States. He wrote about America's treatment of the Native Americans. He wrote about the Haymarket riot. 
he wrote about the Oklahoma land rush and all these essays about treatment of Americans and the factory abuses and so on were things that he conveyed to people who were outside the United States. And that was something really important. I might add that today, even though Jose Marti is not that well known among us, there are identifying markers all over the United States, particularly in the East. There is a museum in Key West. There is a statue of Marti in Central Park. There is a school in New Jersey, a high school named for Marti. The Organization of American States has a sculptor of Marti in its garden. There are many other places I might add that the new school that opened up in Albany, New York, the School of Nanoscience, named one of its inner quadrangle roads, Jose Marti Boulevard. I haven't been able to find out who named it, but this is in Albany. There are Jose Marti markers all over the country. And it's important, I think, that we Georgists know something more about Marti. And I can't speak much more than uh, Lorenzo did, but I'm hoping from my position as a Georgist here in the movement to promote more awareness. Thank you. Actually, there was a bust of uh, Jose Martí right here in Baltimore. It's been removed because of construction, and uh, construction never seems to end right on Broadway and uh, Broadway and Orleans and uh, the inscription on it said he loved the Americans as much as he loved his own country that's, that's what it said so. yes a question you mentioned a poem by Guantanamera was that one by Jose Martí that was by him okay situation in southern United States right now in Miami with the Cuban you know, uh, population there. What is the sentiment of the current situation politically, the potential for change in Cuba based on the various interpretations of Marti's principles? Is, is there a sentiment that is possible for real democratic change in Cuba going forward? Or is it a resignation that state socialism is there forever? Well, that's a $64,000 question. Uh, as far as I know, first of all, Cuban exiles, you know, all the, all the, all the places that you mentioned that have had uh, schools and statues and stuff in the United States named after Martin, a lot of it has to do with actually Cuban exiles in those communities actually pushing for because of the, the respect, the honor that he's given to Marti. He, he is the founder of the ideal Cuban independent republic. That's number one. Number two, I happen to think that Cubans in Miami have been undergoing a change. The earlier Cubans, a good number of them, wanted to maintain the embargo, wanted to keep things closed, which doesn't help anything. Anybody who reads history knows that these things don't work at all. And they, they, you, mean you, you carry on with the hate, but you don't really get anything else done. Right? But the younger people have actually are very different. They come to realize that that doesn't really work. So how open will it be? Uh, I have no idea. I, really, I know that there are a lot of young people in Cuba right now who cannot find work who are doing the best they can with meager resources, showing human ingenuity 
which is vast, which is vast, to make their, their life better within the system. As far as change is concerned, it's going to have to do, it's like any, any situation where people hold power. It doesn't matter where it is. The people that hold power at some point have to relinquish for one reason or another and allow different ideas to have a role. And hopefully, hopefully, I hope that when that does happen, Cuban exiles, people who are here, are not going to try to go there and do it for them. Because I don't even think that the dissidents in Cuba really want to have anything to do with the U.S. intervening there. We've been through that. We've done that. It didn't work either. Thank you very much. You know, they have to be able to do it on their own. How long would that take? I'll probably never see it, but that's okay. Uh, just to follow up, I, I'm scheduled to go to Cuba in December. Okay. How will the weather be there? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you compare it to Baltimore, it's going to be a very mild and warm. And you won't find, I don't think, that humidity that you find, say, today, or, or you find in Miami in December or January, you know, which is suffocating. I don't like it at all. You're going to find that the, the breezes that come from the Caribbean actually ameliorate the heat and make it quite pleasant. And if you go way up in the mountains, uh, bring a sweater at least or two. Okay. And a blanket, because you probably need it. Thanks for being my heel. On the There you go, on. Uh, with the new constitution in Cuba, they are going to recognize the private property. Is that private pro property on the land, or there is it going to be with the proper, uh, I proper have to, power? I, I have to confess my ignorance. I don't know exactly what they're saying. I do know that it has a reference to people's, uh, the ability for people, for example, to sell their cars, because they couldn't sell their cars. They can sell their cars. Uh, they, they, can, they can sell or rent uh, portions of the places where they live. You know, I, I know that much. That can have small businesses, and that's the kind of private property that I understand is being allowed. But it's a very fickle place. It's a very fickle place. You know, uh, I, I think the gentleman that is running things now, unless 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 pushed by the old guard, I don't think he's inclined to bring the old stuff back. I don't think so. He's a relatively young man. And he, I, 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 he's a communist, yes, he's a Marxist, but I don't, I don't think he wants to uh, go back to the, uh, the law is today what I say it is, and tomorrow is what I say it is as well, regardless. Because many of the, oh, excuse, many of the Cuban, well, probably the, uh, the second generation, or the first generation here, they want to go back and claim the, the property. I be, sure. uh, that would be, well, for one uh, had the rights. But the other thing is, if we are going in, in, the, in, the, in the Constitution, it's not clear what is it. Then they are going to be battling the, the government there. If we could somehow, uh, judge any of the, uh, of the social media, to be able to communicate to the young people, because that's what they use. That about Martin uh, uh, and Henry George. But on the point, on the point of people from here going there to get some back. On that point, people going back to claim stuff. That's absurd. That's a practical matter. I think that there's need for reconciliation. It's been 60 years, a lot of water under the bridge, and I really think that if you go back to do business. You're going to have to go back and do business as new business. Thank you, sir. That's my that, That's the point I wanted to speak to because our American government is supportive of those families that were, were that emigrated, you might say. And uh, there's one family near me in Saratoga Springs that was quite wealthy, thank you. And uh, the picture in our local paper was of their home while they were in Cuba. 
and the number of acres that they owned and the factories. And they now want to go back and reclaim that property. That's nonsense. Lorenzo is right. The problem is our American government is supporting these people. The U.S. government encourages that. I, I think I think if my fellow Cubans who had anything that they want to get back at this point, get it back, then we have to give Manhattan back to the Indians. <laughs> I mean, really, seriously. It is a practical impossibility. It's really an absurdity. And it's just um, playing on the old strings, heart strings of people. Memory. Song, you know? yeah, it's over. Uh, uh, Brendan, uh, I, I don't know that much uh, about Marty. I'm interested in learning more. Is, could you paint a picture? Could you give us a picture of what he envisioned um, for land reform and economic reform after the Re revolution? We're talking about the revolution that he, he inspired at his time. Could, could you paint, paint a picture of that? Well, I, I think Bill probably knows the details better than I do from what he just said. But I would say he was, he knew that monopolies come from the favor granted by the rulers. Okay? He understood that. So, when you're talking about land monopolies, which is really, I think, what we're talking about here, we are talking about land grants that the Spaniards, the King of Spain, the Queen of Spain, gave to the people that came to Cuba and other places, okay, and then they, they're sitting over there across the Atlantic and they say, okay, this spot right here, it's yours now. Oh yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of guys living there, you know, but that's okay. That's your spot. Okay, so he, you cannot change that historically, but he wanted to start anew in that regard and make sure that everybody had access to land, access to being able to have their business. He wanted to see a prosperous people, a prosperous independent people. And whatever it took to do that, I think he would have done it. And the land tax it just makes sense. And I think he would have gone for that. But you probably got more detail than I do. I don't think it's clear uh, what Marti would have envisioned because he wrote mainly about the United States, even though there is references to George and Georgist ideas throughout all his writing. Uh, but you've got to understand that right now, all the land in Cuba is owned by the society, the government. So it would not be hard to impose a land tax, a land rent, because those titles are now defunct. That's technically correct, but let's, uh, let's, let's be realistic. The society doesn't really own it. One of the biggest landlords, if not the biggest landlord I understand in Cuba today, happens to be the armed forces. Okay? And I don't think that those guys, those guys may actually change their uniforms for business suits when, they, when the time comes. <laughs> but I don't think, that, like they did in China, but I don't think they're going to really say to some guy down the street living in a one-room place with a roof falling down, you know, hey, how would you like to have a chunk of my stuff over here? I don't think so. I really doubt it very much. Um, so we need a change, a cultural change in Cuba. Um, the vision of an independent country with an independent people never came to fruition, in part because of the, the United States insisting on things like the Platt Amendment. The Platt Amendment was actually something that was made law in, in Cuba, into the Constitution of Cuba, and existed almost from the beginning of the Republic, where the United States had the right to invade Cuba and interfere if the political process got ugly, basically. <laughs> Got ugly, we can go in there and straighten it out for you. You know, eventually it, it got rescinded. Oh, wh one thing, one thing about Marti that is very important, and I wanted to mention it earlier. He was extremely concerned and upset by the idea of manifest destiny. Because he saw manifest destiny for what it was. 
It was a massive land grab. In this case, it took actually almost worldwide impact. And um, this is this is really what he was fundamentally talking about when he was talking about uh, Oklahoma and all of that. He was talking about manifest destiny, the idea that we have this God-given. It's kind of like a like a like a more modern version of divine right monarchy. You know, we have this divine thing granted upon us that we can just go next door and take that guy's place. You know, if they're all this big, we can move in there. We don't want him anything. And um, Martin was greatly disturbed by it. And I think that's why he called it the monster. That was the key thing that made him call it the monster. Because he saw it as a monster that was just rolling forward. Virtually unstoppable. And he was very concerned that it would happen in Cuba and in other places. And, it, well, it, it did. Thank you very much indeed, Lorenzo. I really much uh, enjoyed it. Uh, Thank you. One thing he mentioned about Martin was that uh, he objected to any other form of tax, that of rob being robbed of what yeah. men themselves produce. And in that context, I'm very struck, certainly when I come to America, because I'm from the UK, where so little emphasis seems to be given on the damage that's done by income tax, by corporation taxes, by taxes on trade and uh, buying and selling. And I'm constantly surprised why don't the Americans make more of the damage that's being done by the current system. And you've, here when you're speaking about um, work in Baltimore, again, refer specifically to, in my book, the very, very modest transformation that simply takes the tax off buildings and puts it onto land. It is very modest. It's very simple to do. It's only a question of political will. It's all it is. But with a political will, it's tied to all the crony capitalism that's going on. Right. You know, at the same time, at the same time, that some of the buildings that were put up in the Inner Harbor were given full tax credits at one point so they would be occupied because nobody was moving in. At that same time, the city of Baltimore was actually collecting uh, what amounted to punitive, punitive fees on people of modest means for not having fixed their windows and their doors. Right. Okay? At the same time, at the same time. So that's what, that is, I mean, that... That's the kind of abuse you read about in the history books about the mean kings of Europe. You know, and it's being done right here. The linked uh, issue that uh, was on my mind as you spoke, and again you referred to uh, George not approving of a Marxist approach in, uh, in Cuba. And in that context, uh, that, that, that same, as it were, distinction is made where the Marxist confuses capital with land and thus has to, or capital has to become publicly owned. Uh, again, to the ignorance, really, of earnings. And so I'm just wondering to what extent your thinking has gone to, uh, as it were, clarifying that distinction where the error of the Marxist approach is contrasted with the Georgist approach, which only collects the rental value of land. Very good question. I don't know that I'm qualified to answer that, honestly. But I'll, I'll just give you a little anecdote from the last couple of days, if I can find that. I've made friends on Facebook with a Marxist Leninist. And uh, it's amazing how we agree on certain things. Okay? And it turned out that um, he respects Adam Smith's wealth of nations. <laughs> Because he said Adam Smith was actually a moral man. He has nothing to do with the people today. And my answer was, because the people that we call capitalists today are really not capitalists. They're actually probably present-day mercantilists. Yes, yes. That's, what they really That's the confusion of capital with money. Yep. Can, yep. can, I, can I have a, a question yes. right here? Um, Wait, this is to be the last one. Oh, the, all right, the big last one. Uh, you mentioned Adam Smith, and I was wondering whether um, Marti um, 
had any knowledge or was inspired anyway by the physiocrats who had founded several of the South American republics. Was he aware of that connection at all? I cannot say that with any information. No. I cannot give a yes or a no. But I do know that the countries that he lived in, he became, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't a tourist. He went in there and he lived with the people, he wrote for them, and he learned and he helped them, you know, in, uh, with, to uh, strengthen their culture. So he must have had some knowledge of that. He, he must have. But I, I cannot say that. Okay, thank just, you. Just as a,